I have too much material this morning, so we got to move on, all right? Uh, prosperity doctrine. Boy, the, the preachers on TV that preach prosperity get hit pretty hard, don't they? Would Jesus wear a Rolex? Wasn't that an old song? Would Jesus wear a Rolex? Maybe that was Ray Stevens, huh? <laughs> yep. I remember one time we had a missionary from Africa. What was his name? I know him well, but I can't think of his name. Man, he got up at our missions conference and he said, don't come over here to Africa and preach the prosperity doctrine. It don't work. Well, prosperity is measured in many different ways in different countries. And I remember the missionary in Haiti say prosperity mean, might mean here that you have a chicken to put in your rice. <laughs> So prosperity could be measured in different ways in different places. But you know what I'm interested in? I want to know what does the Bible say about it? And if you've ever got a note from me, and uh, over the years we've sent out a lot of notes, I often put this verse in here from 3 John 2, which is absolutely one of my favorite verses in the Bible, where John said in that little short one-chapter book, Beloved, I wish above all things, somebody say all things, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as, their, even as thy soul prospers. So here we go. This is important you understand this. You want health and prosperity as your soul prospers. Okay? The love of money is the root of all evil. And prosperity is not just measured in money. Amen. I knew some people who had nothing that were happier than most of us. Paul said, I've learned to be contented whatever state I'm in. So we're going to talk about it today. And we preached about Joshua a couple of weeks ago. We're going back to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein, for then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Now, remember, Jesus only had one Bible. He didn't have Matthew through Revelation, okay? The truth is, he was Matthew through Revelation, uh, but he quoted often from the Old Testament. In fact, the book of Deuteronomy, one of my favorite books in the Bible, he quoted from the book of Deuteronomy more than any other book. And likewise, so did the writers of the epistles in the New Testament. So then again, Proverbs 10 and 14 said, Wise people store up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. So let's go to our handouts today. And the first thing I want you to note is that you will not commit if you are not convinced. People will not commit to anything they're not convinced of. And this could be possibly a reason that some people do not live out the teachings that are taught in the Scripture because they're not convinced of them. When you're convinced of them that they are indeed truth and the Word of God, you will live them out. We're going to talk about success. The only place that word in the King James Version is found is in Joshua 1 and 8. Success, according to Strong's Hebrew lexicon, means to be prudent, to be circumspect. That word circumspect means it's a New Testament word, too, that you see all the way around. It's a circle. You see, you see all the way around. To be circumspect to wisely understand and to prosper. So that is part of the definition of this word success from Strong's is to prosper. So when we talk about being prosperous, we are in line with the Word of God. And the promise that God gave to Joshua was that if you do these things, He gives him a recipe he gives him a book, I might say, with a recipe 
for success. But here's the recipe. Are you ready for this? Number one, he said, it shall not depart out of thy mouth. Because the power of life and death is in the tongue. That's why you should pray the word. Pray the word. Do not let it depart out of thy mouth. In fact, the first command was what? Love the Lord with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. There's one Lord. And then what does he say? Write it on the post of your door. Then he says, teach it to your children. This word needs to be in the mouth. Secondly, he said, meditate in it day and night. This is the recipe, Joshua, for your success, for your prosperity, for your health. And then finally, he said, do all. Do according to all that is written therein. So, you know, it, it's not enough just to know if you don't do. Praise God. The proof of our desires and our pursuit. I'm not going to preach to you about this because you're here. But I'm amazed at people who don't need first word. You know, I've never heard anybody teach that I didn't get something out of. Even if it was what I don't want to do. That amazes me. You know, when I was a kid growing up in a church, we had, we kinda, we had Sunday school like we have now. All through the years, you have 10 o'clock, you go to your class, they ring a bell at 11. Our churches were small enough, you could hear the bell all over the church. So that was the Sunday school superintendent's primary job was to ring that bell. <coughs> so and even in those days, we had people that came for 11 o'clock service. You know what we thought of those people? They were carnal. <laughs> they were backslid. <laughs> I'm, why am I teaching you that? Well, I'm going to stay home and watch it online. No, you don't. <laughs> if you're sick, you're might, but you don't feel good, you're not going to get anything out of it. <laughs> Amen. And then you get kids and you start coming for first word because you want your kids to be in Sunday school. But what about your hide? Amen. I'm not apologizing. We don't have Sunday night services anymore, and we have Sunday night worship. And, you know, I, we, we've fallen into the trap of the world to make it convenient. Oh, Lord. I told you I had too much, and now I'm meddling. Number three says there are two elements to the gospel. Watch this. This is so important. I'm not saying anything today I hadn't said before and many things many times. There are two elements to the gospel. Number one is the Son of God. Number two, it's the Son of God's teachings. Okay? The person of Jesus Christ prepares you for heaven. And this comes from an experience with God. Thank God for Calvary. Amen? Amen. Thank God for Calvary. So the second is this. The principles of Jesus Christ prepare you to live on earth. This is called the wisdom of God or the expertise of God. Now understand, you can be saved and be miserable. You can be saved and overdue on all your bills. <clears throat> Thank you. How many of you love allergy season? Did you understand what I just said? You don't have to have money in the bank to go to heaven. I've lived broke week to week, and I've lived with money in the bank. And I'm going to tell you, I like a whole lot better with money in the bank. It makes life easier, don't it? Money answereth all things. <coughs> Praise God. The entrance of thy word giveth light, the scripture said. It giveth understanding to the simple. Brother Woodward taught us the simple man is, is, is a, is a uh, the simple man is mentioned many times in the book of Proverbs. The scorner, the fool, the simple, and the wise are the four categories that are mentioned. A simple man is a man that just don't know. A fool's a man who don't know, don't know he don't know, 
and don't care he don't know. As Brother Ryan said, all you grammar teachers don't freak out on me here this morning. <laughs> Praise God. You see, God gave us a recipe for success, and I believe this so strongly, and I've tried in my life to preach this, and there's nothing that brings me greater joy than to see people come in and start following God's principles and watch God begin to bless their life. I cannot tell you how much thrill that brings to pastors and to others who are trying to be disciple makers. God has a recipe. God don't want you to sink. He wants you to soar. He don't want you to crawl. He wants you to fly. He wants you to stand, not be stumbling around and staggering. I copied a quote that I saw from Pastor Bob Meyer in Paris, Texas, and he said, casual doesn't fit Christianity. The Christian life is not a casual life. All right? Isaiah said, woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. When Zion travails, sons and daughters will be born. It's interesting, there were no chairs in the tabernacle in the wilderness for the priests to sit down in and take a break. There were no chairs. The floor was made of dirt because it was going to be transported so they didn't have anything but dirt. They stood it there because God wants you to look up, not down. When you walk into his presence, he, he didn't design a plan for you to look down at the beggarly elements of this world. We are to look up. And when you looked up in that tabernacle, you didn't see dirt. You saw a lot of nice things because that tabernacle was made out of nice stuff. But it had a dirt floor and there was no place to sit down because your walk with God demands passion and it demands perseverance like we don't stop years ago there was a there was a pastor who was the superintendent of the western district which was in those days was california and nevada now it's been divided up his name was paul price he was an icon in our movement he was really an icon in california and probably pastored no telling how many people called him pastor not just in his local church Anyway, I had written an article for the Herald by request, and he read the article one day. I didn't know him that well. I was around him a little bit, admired him. But he called me, and he'd read that article, and uh, just wanted to tell me he'd read the article. And so it turned out to be quite a little congregation there. And he started preaching to me, and I grabbed a legal pad and a pen, and I began to write things down. And I invited him to come preach at our church. And this is what he told me. He said, I'm 80 years old, Brother Dean. He said, I don't travel much anymore. And he said, honestly, I don't have time to spend with people who are not hungry for God. <laughs> I don't know if he was implying that most people are that way in churches. I don't know. And he said, at this stage in my life, I just want to know Jesus. And then he made a statement that I never forgot. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. He said, hungry people don't get offended. If we're not willing to suffer with him, it's only through what we suffer with him that helps us to know him. And he makes a statement, I'd rather be pure than a great preacher. He said, it's tragic that Judas was not close enough to any of the other disciples to tell them what he was struggling with. Neither did any of the other disciples discern that Judas was having a problem. They did not know what he was going to do when he walked out of that Passover room. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Then he asked an, uh, an interesting question uh, to me. He was preaching to me on the phone. He said, he, he talking about Job. He said, how did God introduce Job? Because God introduced Job to the devil. And then he asked the question, I wonder how God would introduce you. That's thought-provoking, isn't it? He said, if God took everything away from you, would you still serve him? I'm working on a sermon I'm going to preach about worship. First mention of the word worship in the Bible is very important. I've been taught that all my ministerial life. First time you see a word mentioned. First time worship is mentioned, there was no singing, musical instruments, drums, piano, hand clapping, none of that. Zero. How many knows when the first 
When was the first time the word worship was used in the Bible? Anybody know? See, that's why you come to first word. Because I've said this many times and you forgot it. It's when Abraham offered Isaac. He said, the lad and I go yonder to worship. They didn't have any singing. They didn't have any of that stuff. Hello. That's going to be a good sermon, isn't it? (laughs) So anyway, Brother Price, I'm going to skip over some of this. Uh, He was doing this. They used to have, Brother Tenney had this morning manna deal at camp meeting. It was for preachers only and their wives. And, and Paul Price was the speaker. And so you had to get over there early. It was early. And so we had probably 10 young men in the church who felt a call to preach. And they, many of them were staying in the dorm. And this man, without a note, when a big old Bible with a leather case around it was spewing out wisdom like, I'm taking notes as fast as I can write. And I go over to the dorm after it's over, and all these wannabe preachers are asleep. And I screamed my head off and woke them up. I said, what do you, I thought you guys want to be preachers. It's going to get quieter and quieter as the day goes on. Amen. And they're like, one of, them, one of them said, man, we were up late last night. Oh, really? Oh, really? The proof of your desires in your pursuit. And that, that's why I'm talking about this stuff this morning. And I called Brother, I, I sent this, I copied this. I found it yesterday and I copied it and sent it to Lee Stone King. Lee, uh, Brother Price loved Lee Stone King and actually had a uh, not legal, but some kind of a deal where he adopted him as his son. Brother Price lived within one month of 100 years old. And Brother Stone King called me. And then I liked to never got off the phone with him, and I enjoyed every single second of it. He said, Brother Dean, he's 84 years old almost. He said, this torch has been passed to the younger generation. And he said, I give them permission to do what God's telling them to do. And as he would say, he said, he said I told some of them, if anyone gives you trouble, send them to me. Let me tell you what I told those young preachers that morning. God doesn't put the grapes in your hands. He puts them within your reach. And you've got to go get them. Because there's a lot of things in life I had no choice in. I didn't have a choice on who my parents were. I didn't have a choice on the color of my eyes or how big my ears would be. Or my nose. I didn't have a choice whether my hair would stay in or fall out. I didn't have a choice for that. There are some very important things, though, that should determine our happiness. And we have choices about that. Number four said, God gave me some beautiful qualities to help me have success. Number one, I have awareness. Now, you can play dumb. I choose not to. I choose to be aware that my life without God was empty. And that there really is an inner longing for a creator in my soul. And I was aware that the Bible had the answer. Number two, I have honesty in myself. You can deceive yourself if you choose. Or you can be honest. You can take a good, long, hard look at yourself. And if you want to do it, if you're brave enough, talk to your spouse if you're married. If not, your closest friend and say, Help me find the shortcomings in my life. You can be honest in yourself and say, God, I really need you. And you know, this is the one first step that they teach in a lot of the recovery programs is that you you have to admit that you're helpless without the creator. Number three, I can count the cost. I have the ability to say, am I willing to pay the price to reach this place in my life? If God wants me to prosper and have success, then am I willing to pray the price? And number four, I have faith. Because I believe everybody has faith because the Word of God said God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. I believe that God exists and I believe He rewards those who diligently seek Him because it's in the Bible. So here are some of the, here are some of the things that I will teach you as we hasten on with this. There are some things I need to consecrate to God. Number one is my talents and my abilities. 
Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 and 31, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I might say he's using the Old Testament as a reference point to say that. Matthew 25 tells us we all have gifts, some 10, some 1. Because that's God's choice. He gives some people a little brighter brain than he gives others. Amen. And I'm responsible. Why are y'all laughing? They're looking at each other down here like. <laughs> you know, uh, I got to give my abilities and my talents to him. If I only use them for myself. That's not the recipe for success. Amen. We have different talents. We have different abilities. There are areas I may be strong in your weekend. Well, why don't we help each other? My oldest son runs a very large company in Houston, and he told me one day crying. He said, Daddy, he said, the people that are above me can't read a spreadsheet. And I read a spreadsheet, and it just makes sense, and I don't know why. And he started crying. Well, that's a God-given talent and a God-given ability. You need to use that for the glory of God, son. He won't be watching this, but maybe somebody will text him and say, watch. Right. Number two is my job or my career. I wonder what would happen if we all said, you know what? I'm here in my job for a reason. We got a neighbor up in Oklahoma that's been helping me and my wife with some things that need to be done. And we, we have both determined that it's not an accident that God ordered our steps so we can be together. What if, what if we all came to the conclusion, God has me where I am, and I'm going to use my, I'm going to, I'm going to consecrate my career, my job, whatever I'm doing to God. Yeah. I don't care if you're mowing a lawn. Yeah. Do it with a spirit of excellence. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise God. Number three is my finances. My attitude toward money reveals my true values. Everybody say my finances. It starts with your tithe. To me, the tithe is one of the easiest things to teach in the Bible. Jesus said, you ought not to leave that undone. You know what tithe says? God is first in my life. And there are so many people in this church that have realized the benefit of tithing that we have a strong tithing church. And if you're not a tither, number one, you're out of the will of God. And you have to do these things. He said, I want you to put them in your mouth. I want you to meditate on, on them. And, you know, God's promised some things. The only place in the Bible, he said, just try me. Just put me to the test and see if I will not pour out a blessing. Somebody said, well, I tithe and nothing happened. Well, you got to do all the principles. You can't just tithe and forget everything else that was taught. But I, I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to, I want to give God. I want to, I want to consecrate my finances to him. Because I think God wants us to be successful. And success in one man's life may not be the same as another or a woman. It may be two different things. Somebody say amen. amen. Can, this, can somebody witness to what I'm telling you right now? Because I want to give God my finances. And I don't want to get too personal here, but I have instructions in my will, even for tithing, because I may have prospered in some areas that I didn't realize, and I want that 10% to go to God, because I believe in that so strongly, and I've lived my life to it. And, you know, uh, some people, and I, I got to hurry, I'm not going to finish, good Lord. Oh, Jesus, I said some things that didn't even need to be said, and I'm doing it right now. Number six, anything God can do was meant to happen to you. And I, I want to say this, and I want to say it with some passion, all right? Number one, you have worth. Amen. If you're sitting in this building, you have worth. I don't care what anybody told you. I don't care even if your mother and dad said crazy things like you're ignorant, you're stupid, you're never amount to any. I don't care what they said. I'm going by the Bible. You have worth. The next blank said God created you. Do you think God would create junk? God didn't create junk. Your whole life is mapped out in your DNA. My dear friend, Harold Alpin, has a brain tumor. They said it was probably in his DNA at birth. 
God created you. He knows who you are. Amen. And then God placed at our disposal an unlimited wealth of resources. And I want to stop here and say thank God for the United States of America. I see $80,000 vehicles pulling lawnmowers. Am I dreaming? Go to Russia and do that. Go to Argentina and buy an $80,000 lawnmower mowing somebody else's lawn. Are we not the most spoiled people in all the world? I did not know one person growing up that had somebody else mow their lawn. And it certainly didn't happen in the Dean house. We had five boys. I mean, my dad taught himself how to cut our hair. Of course, it wasn't too hard. It's a number one. He couldn't afford to take five boys to the barber. <laughs> Amen. God placed at our disposal unlimited wealth of resources. Remember this, the grapes are not for the holy, they're for the hungry. You can be separated apostate in all of that, but God said to Joshua, you got to go possess the land. I'm going with you. I'm going to make your way prosperous. Amen. There are... Number seven says there are at least three reasons, and there's probably more, but I'm going to give you three reasons that God wants you to succeed, all right? Number one, your life is on display. Paul said, ye are our epistle known and read of all men. Amen? If you can't pay your bills, you're not a good testimony of the blessing of God. So you need to find out what principles you're violating. I hope that don't sound mean. But if you're talking about the blessed life and you're calling to get somebody to help you with your electric bill, something ain't right. <laughs> you didn't like that, did you? I got one that's right back there. You are an epistle. You're read and known of all men. And I'm going to say this again. I'm going to say... <laughs> I love my second row here. They... <laughs> They laugh at what I say when all of you staring at me like I've got cotton balls in my mouth or something. I, I don't have a clue. God wants you to serve as an example of what happens in somebody's life when they follow godly principles. Now listen, it don't always happen. In fact, most time it don't happen overnight. It takes months and sometimes years for people to start following these principles. It's in the book of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes. He said, cast your bed upon the waters, and in many days it will come back to you. You go out weeping, the psalmist said, bearing precious seed. Somebody say precious seed. That was called precious because that may be the seed that daddy was going to give to mama to make the food they were going to eat. But daddy knew if I don't plant this seed, we're not going to have food next year. So he learned to live godly principles. And he came home rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Number two, God wants you to provide for your family. He said in 1 Timothy 5 and 8, if a man doesn't provide for his own, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So let, me, let me promise you this. There's so much poverty in our world, and a lot of the poverty that's in our world came about because of the great society of where the government began to take care of people, and people lost their incentive to work. And I don't have time for that. Jesus, help us. And that's not political. That's Bible. The Jewish people took one little line out of the Torah and developed it into a principle, one of the 613 laws that they found in the Torah. And it said, thou shalt do thy work. And they built a whole doctrine out of that. Yeah. Amen. All right. And then to carry out the Great Commission, and I believe this so strongly, it's 1037. Can I go ahead and finish and we'll just won't make a lot of comments, all right? Well, I'm going to, so you might as well say amen. I'm giving you some good stuff this morning. You ought to go home and read this again, and you ought to say, you know, am I doing this? Am I, am I living this out? But finally, it's to carry out the Great Commission. That's what God is intending for us to do because the Great Commission is a tool in the believer's hand. 
The Great Commission is a tool in the believer's hand. When they asked me to speak this year, and you can take this as a boast if you want, and just go ahead and shoot an arrow up here, and I'll deflect it or whatever, because it's not a boast in me, it's a boast in you. But when they asked me to preach at General Conference, and, and, and after the message, $5.2 million was raised for global missions, and you can say, well, you think your word did it? No, I'm going to tell you what did it, because we have some corn in the crib, and everybody in that congregation has heard about the Pentecostals of Bossier, and they know I'm preaching something that I lived out and that you lived out, and we couldn't have done any of it without the precious people of God. So this is why God wants you to prosper and be blessed, is so we can help carry out the Great Commission. And thank God we built Bible schools all over this planet. Thank God for what you've done. And that was a part, and in that deal, Paul said, in, in that sermon, I brought out this verse where Paul said, God gives bread for the, for, the, for the eater and bread for the sower. In other words, God doesn't just bless you so you can eat everything he blessed you with. He blessed you to sow. How can I measure success? And I'll finish. By becoming what God wants me to come. That's success. To hear him say, well done. God, I want to hear that. My friend is on hospice. One of the greatest preachers in the world who impacted my life more than you or I will probably ever know. And I'm thinking of the mind and the brain, but, but just to be able to hear me, he taught me things about ministry and success, and I'm thinking, oh God, just to hear you say, well done. That's how I measure success. Number two, by doing what God wants me to do. And I won't hear well done unless I have done what he asked me to do. And number three is by possessing what God wants me to own. Success is not just getting what you want. Thank God for some unanswered prayers. I'm so glad I didn't get Teresa. I probably shouldn't have said that. I'm glad I got Gina. If you read my Texas Bible College annual, all in the back where people write, you know, you and I shouldn't have called her name. It's, it's too late. That's what Brother Hoffman's wife told me on the phone the other day. She said, Jerry, I didn't go out with him preaching because he would always embarrass me by things he said. I never knew what he was going to say. <laughs> I've known of men and women who gave up everything to get a guy or a girl. When they got what they wanted, they didn't want what they got. Success is not a city where you're going to arrive tomorrow. We've all found this out. Success is not a new home necessarily. Success is not a new automobile necessarily. Success is a journey. It's a journey. It's like enjoying today, today, today. Number 10, never justify failure. Quit blaming everybody else. Don't get bogged down by placing the blame on others that I never got a break. I never got this. I never got that. Happiness begins between your ears. My wife's little grandmother up where we have her place, she didn't have hardly anything, and she was just as contented as she can be. It's amazing. I've always been amazed at that. Job said, Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. That's Job 22 and 1. Get to know God. And start seeking the Lord. Amen. I want to tell you real quick, it's 1041. We'll just won't say a lot about this. There are obstacles to uncommon success. Number one is an unteachable spirit. It's an unwillingness to change. If you're not willing to change, you'll never live a blessed life. Jesus, God said through Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Solomon said, a wise man will hear and increase learning. Number two is unpaid vows. In the recovery program, they teach about restitution for things you've done in your life. You've got to go make things right. Gee, the, the Bible said you'd be better off never to make a vow than to make one and break it. Number three is unforgiven offenses. Jesus said, when you stand praying, forgive. Can I say that again? When you stand praying, forgive. So who have you not forgiven? These are obstacles to your success. You getting this? Unwise associations. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. 
And I want to tell you right here, don't let the pain of your past poison your future because we've all got some pain in our past. And I grew up in the church with the godly mama and dad as my wife did. But we both know what pain from the past feels like, both of us. So just because you grew up in the church doesn't mean you don't have pain from your past. The next is an unbridled tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and it's the hardest member of your body to control. Can I get a witness? Do you, you do know why I said that, right? Because that's what the Bible said. <laughs> the next one is undeveloped gifts and abilities. Undeveloped I mean God blessed you with some things, some gifts, and some abilities. Praise God. Use them for the kingdom. And finally, an uncommitted heart. A double-minded man, James said in 1 and 8, is unstable in all his ways. I've made up my mind I'm going to live for God. Amen. Amen. There are some people who I have pastored all these years and now senior pastor that would have gone to heaven without me. There are other people that no matter what I did would not have gone to heaven because they never committed. But there are some people I feel like I have made a difference in their life. And that's why I taught what I taught to you this morning is 1044, and nobody ever goes this long in first word. But that's why I'm teaching you what I'm teaching you this morning. You, 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 well, Brother Ryan did the other day. You, that's why I gave you this. Stick it in your Bible take it home and pull it out and say who am I not forgiven what pain from my past is holding me back we've all made mistakes right don't justify your failure let's stand father we taught some principles from your word this morning you want us to prosper and be in health I know that because it's in your word so this morning help us to live and learn the principles Understanding you, you are a respecter of principles. That if we're willing and obedient, we'll eat the good of the land. Teach us how. And whatever we're lacking in our life, in areas where we're slow, to do the will of God, would you help us? Because I think every one of us here are living to hear those words, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name.